everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our lunchtime lecture. This morning, we've got Bianca Mini with us. Bianca is a young professional in the coal mining industry. She's got some four years experience as a coal geology specialist in the Whitbank coal field, working there for South 32. Her main focus is on exploration project management, borehole database management, and data validation to ensure data integrity for resource modeling. More recently, Bianca has received her MSc in geology from the University of Johannesburg, and she's focusing on reactive ground borehole drilling, logging, sampling, and data interpretation. And that is the topic for today's lunchtime lecture as well, an investigation into whether reactive ground is present in the central Whitbank coal field. Bianca, we look forward to hearing from you further on this. Share your screen and off you go. All right. Um, thanks, Tanya, for the introduction. Um, uh, can everybody see my screen fine? Not yet. You still got to hit the, the share screen button. Bottom um, right hand side. Yep. And it that a screen there we go we can see All you right. we can hear you okay so um good afternoon everybody um thank you for the opportunity given to me to present to you today as tanya has mentioned um i'm a geology specialist in the woodbank coal field for south 32 and today I'll be presenting my master's thesis topic to you, um, an investigation into whether reactive ground is present in the central Whitbank coal field. I'm just trying to get my next slide here. Okay, there you go. Okay, so the content of my presentation today is I'll do a bit of a safety share. Um, then I'll go through an introduction. Um, we'll go through what reactive ground is, and then um, we'll go through the project, the project background, the methodology that we used. Um, I'll explain the results and also the conclusion and recommendations that we made on the research project. Okay, so at the mine, we have something called a material risk. So a material risk is an event that has been classified by the mine that if an event should occur, that it will result in multiple fatalities. So for any one material risk, there can be one or more critical controls put into place. And these controls are put into place to reduce the likelihood and or the impact of the material risk. So I'm telling you this because one of the material risks on, on our mine is uncontrolled detonation of explosives. So as you can imagine that that poses a fatal risk to anybody that is working in the environment if a blast goes off prematurely. So one of the critical controls for this material risk that we have is the monitoring of reactive ground. And that will also be our key word and our topic for this presentation. Okay, so introduction on how this research project came about is in February 2018, um, the mine experienced an uncontrolled um, detonation of explosives in one of our active mining pits. So after the event, the mine undertook a detailed investigation into factors that might possibly contribute to, um, contributed to this event. Reactive ground was identified as one of the possible um, factors that could have in, impacted this event. So unfortunately for us, the testing procedure for reactive ground um, is not a well-documented procedure. And the only guideline that we could find and follow was the code of practice for elevated temperatures and reactive ground of the Australian Explosives Industry and Safety Group, um, of which the 2017 version is the latest one. 
As this is an explosives focused COP and not solely focused on um, the testing procedure for reactive ground, we had to design our own testing procedure. The aim of the project was then um, to enhance a scientific and objective basis for the prediction of reactive ground. So on the right hand side there, I have a small picture for you um, of where this research project was located. So if you can see the red star, it's in the Whitbank gold field, um, oh, the Whitbank coal field, sorry, um, in the frayed formation from the echo group. Okay, so firstly, for those of you that are not as familiar with the term reactive ground, I'll go through a quick de definition. Um, reactive ground is defined as ground in which re reaction between sulfides, especially iron and copper sulfides contained in rock and ammonium nitrate contained in the explosives may take place and result in the premature detonation of explosives. So ammonium nitrate explosives are used in the mining industry and have the potential to exothermally react with the lithologies um, containing sulfide bearing minerals such as pyrite. So premature detonation can potentially injure or in severe cases, it can actually cause loss of life um, in the vicinity of the blast. So if you are interested more into the chemical reaction that takes place between the sulfides and the ammonium nitrate, you can um, look up the link that I posted for you on this slide. It will give you a more in detail description of the chemical reaction that takes place. Okay, so a background on the mine that I'm working at. Um, it's an open cast operation. We mainly use drag lines and shovels to expose coal. Um, the drag lines are used especially to expose pillar coal, which is left behind from previously underground workings. Um, the study includes four active mining pits and four balls were drilled per pit. So um, that means that the database for this project was 16 balls. And um, during this project, we also collected um, a total of 255 samples. So the focus of this project was then um, to determine the amount or the percentage of sulfur present in each lithology, the boil temperatures, because temperature um, also plays a, uh, plays a major role in reactive ground, and then also um, the potential for each lithology um, to react with ammonium nitrate. Okay, so on the right hand side, that was a, a mini risk assessment that we did before we started with the project. So these are reactive ground indicators and there are 10 of them. So we went and looked which one of these ones applied to the mine that um, the project was based on. So the presence of sulfur is an indicator um, above 1% could be a possible contributing factor. And based on previously exploration, drilling and analysis done, we know that there are lithologies that have above 1% 1, 1 sulfur. The presence of black sulfide containing sediments. So we have black shale that has pyrite in it. So that was also a tick. Sulfur containing mineralized rock. Some of our sandstone units um, also consists of um, pyrite. So that's also um, a tick. Uh, uh, oxidation of minerals usually identified by white or yellowish, yellowish salts. So this could, uh, um, could be identified in some of our core samples as well as old high wool um, high walls. Um, acid conditions, um, mining always goes along with acid mine drainage, so there is acid condi um, conditions on the mine as well. Excessive corrosion of rocks, uh, of rock bolts, safety mesh and fixed equipment. So because this was a previously underground mine, um, they left some equipment, some structures, um, uh, tools, what, what you might think of left underground. Um, so from time to time, as we mine, we also expose these, um, these things. Then spontaneous combustion. Um, so with pillar mining, um, mostly you'll always have spontaneous combustion because of the introduction of oxygen into the system. So especially one of our pits um, 
are prone to spontaneous combustion. Um, and because of the sulfur um, in some of our sediments, we also have that um, smell of that um, sulfide, that rotten egg smell that you usually have. Um, elevate, uh, elevated boil temperatures, we have those as well because of the spontaneous combustion and it walks hand in hand with the elevated ground temperatures. So as you can see on this risk assessment, um, the mine tested positive for 10 out of 10 of the indicators um, for reactive ground. So it's definitely something that we needed to look at. Okay, so this is the methodology that we fo um, followed. So for each of our active pits, we drilled one control hole. Um, a control hole is meant that the entire core column of the um, ball was logged and sampled and sent for analysis. Um, so LaRue, Buerta, 2010, I do have the references at the, at the back of the slide. Um, he suggested that um, samples for reactive ground testing should be kept free from contamination to ensure that the test results um, uh, are as accurate as possible. So for that, he recommended diamond quartering, and that's exactly what we did. Um, each ball was logged in the field as soon as possible as drilling completed. That's to reduce the amount of exposure um, to natural elements. Um, and then um, the logging information was captured into our ball database at the time, GBIS, um, to generate a lithological column for each one of the 16 balls. Samples were taken according to lithology, uh, lithology type. And then um, if a lithology exceeded two meters, we would then split the samples into two meter segments. So for instance, if a lithology um, was 3.5 meters, you would have a two meter sample and a 1.5 meter sample. And then at each ball, the temperature was also monitored to see if temperature might play a role in that specific ball. Okay, um, so what happens with um, the samples that we sample when we log core? So firstly, we do the core sampling. Um, then it is transported to the lab where the sample preparation um, for reactive ground testing will then take place. So the sample prep for reactive ground um, includes the sample to be crushed to um, a negative 3.3 uh, uh, millimeters. Um, that sample is uh, then put through a rotary splitter. So I do have a picture of a splitter there on the right hand side for you. Um, that is to obtain a representative one kilogram sample. The one kilogram sample is then milled to negative two, uh, 212 microns. And that sample is also then vacuum sealed. So it's not exposed to too much oxygen. And your vacuum sealed one kilogram sample was then transported to the BME lab um, for the reactive ground testing. So BME is the lab that we used to do the reactive ground analysis for us. Okay, so what does reactive ground analysis look like? So we did um, two major types. We did something called a chemical compatibility test, also known as an isothermal test, and then we did XRF analysis. So what is the chemical compatibility test? So your mixed crushed, uh, your, your crushed sample is mixed with ammonium nitrate in a ratio of 30-70, 30% sample, 70% explosives. Um, the total of the mixture will add up to about 100 grams. So it's not a lot. Um, it's, it's so that if a reaction should occur that you can still um, mitigate the reaction or limit the, the effects of the event. And then that mixture was also tested in two sets of conditions under 50 degrees Celsius and 75 degrees Celsius. So we decided on to do it on a 75 degrees Celsius as well because we do have hot holes on the mine where um, the project took place and um, because of spontaneous combustion. So it just accounts for the fact that temperature might be um, a factor. Um, and then that sample was monitored for five to seven days for any change in temperature. So a change in temperature would indicate a reaction is taking place and it will also indicate that um, reactive ground um, 
is possible in that pathology, that specific sample. Um, and then for the XRF analysis, we concentrated on the percentage of sulfur present in each lithology. Um, and we did that because the amount of sulfur is definitely um, a contributing factor to, have react to having reactive ground. And then um, by identifying lithological units um, with sulfur concentration above uh, 1%, um, we could identify zones that are prone to reactive ground. Um, the lab also would then report the results back to the mine, um, and then we would do the data interpretation. So the results for this project was that for the 255 samples that we took, um, none of them um, showed positive results in um, in terms of the chemical compatibility test, um, but the lab report does state that this does not exempt the mine from reactive ground. And um, this statement is made because reactive ground can be very isolated. It's highly dependent on changing factors. So sulfur concentration, acid mine drainage, temperatures, those things can change very quickly. Um, and for the mere of that fact, and because um, the mine at which this event took place um, had 10 of the contributing factors, and it was then recommended that um, continuous reactive ground monitoring should be done on an annual basis um, in the mining direction or in the pit, as the pits advance. Um, I just put a small quote for you there on the right hand side. True prevention is not waiting for bad things to happen. It's preventing things from happening in the first place. So that is why we then now do um, annually monitoring of reactive ground. And we do two, whole, two balls per pit, um, each of our active pits. Okay, so for the XRF analysis, um, this is what, what I did. Um, so, like I said before, it's um, focused on the sulfur concentra concentration um, for each lithological type. Um, and then um, I specifically looked at those ones that have um, more than 1% um, sulfur in it. Um, and there's a graph on the right hand side of how, how my line graphs looked. Um, so for this example, you can see it's one, um, it's one of our bores, actually the first one that we drilled, and it shows a definite peak, three peaks of um, samples that gave us um, sulfur concentrations above 1%. Uh, 1%. And by combining these results with the lithological graphs that we generated for each wall, we could then identify four units, four main zones across the mine with high sulfur concentration prone for reactive ground. So in our continuous monitoring um, on an annual basis, we will then just sample these zones together with the coal um, to do the monitoring. Okay, so as I said before, um, we identified four main zones. Um, if you are familiar with the um, geology, uh, geology of the Whitbank coal field, um, this would make a little bit more sense. So our first zone was above the um, four, upper, four upper beam, um, just below the limit of weathering. So that's very high up. Um, the second one was between the four upper A and the four lower, which was actually a sandstone zone. Um, the third one was between the four low and the three, uh, three seam, a sandy shale zone. And then um, the fourth continuous um, zone across the entire mine was the shale unit above the two seam. And that's quite a big um, package, um, quite a large shale unit above the two seam. So in conclusion, um, sorry, that should that should be a 10. Um, so the reactive ground indicators were 10 out of 10 um, um, at the mine where the uh, research took place. The XRF analysis was done and it helped us to identify four major zones on the mine with high sulfur concentration that we will um, be doing our annual monitoring on. Even though the compatibility test proved to be negative, um, 
uh, with yeah, proved to be negative, um, we will still continue with the monitoring as reactive ground I've mentioned before is very isolated and our conditions at the mine change very, very fast. Um, it, then coming back to the event that um, actually initiated this project, um, we found that it is unlikely that the uncontrolled detonation that took place um, was due to reactive ground. Um, this is because the chemical compatibility test in the area proved to be negative, and also there was no hot holes in the area. The balls actually measured at 25 degrees Celsius, which is quite cool. Um, ammonium nitrate explosives used on the mine is therefore appropriate as none of the zones were actively classified as reactive ground. Um, and then, like I said, we will do continuous monitoring on an annual basis. Uh, for any of you that are more interested in reactive ground, um, I put in some references for you um, to have a read if you want to. And yeah, from my side, um, that was my presentation. So we can open. I'm not sure, Tanya, how much time is left for a few questions. If there we is. have enough time for anybody who wants to, to ask any questions. If you like, either raise your hand to the raise hand function or just unmute yourself and ask your question. Bianca, one for me. Um, uh, the reactive ground has, generally speaking, has a very high sulfur content. Is this always stratigraphically controlled or, or can it um, uh, cross cut stratigraphy? Um, sorry, Craig, just say again. Well, can, will, will high sulfur zones tend to be restricted to stratigraphic units or, or can you, can high sulfur zones cross stratigraphy? Um, I'm sure um, I'm sure it can cross the tigraphy. So it's like I said before, it's just dependent on um, the other conditions as well. So it's not necessarily that if if a zone has a high sulfur concentration, that active ground would be present. All the other factors also play a role, like temperature and all of that. You want to answer your question, Craig? Yeah, I think so. Um, and it just is, is annual monitoring enough? Well, we hope that, that it's enough. Um, it proves, it turns out to be quite expensive. And um, we do it, we do annual monitoring because uh, at our mine, for instance, it, it, it all depends on, on where you at. Um, we mine one, one or two strips a year. So we would just do the reactive ground for the next strip. So, for the next strip. So each year when we mine, we know we've done reactive ground in that strip. That leads on to a question from, from myself, Bianca. Um, yeah. more, more general question with respect to explosive ground testing on any given mine in any given year. How many explosive events would you expect to prevent? By this testing, would it prevent all ex all explosive events, or just a, a certain percentage of? Well, Tanya, um, uncontrolled detonations um, are not are not that common. If it does happen, it it's a very specific or um, specific event with contributing factors. So, um, because we don't have an active classified reactive ground. Um, region, yeah, um, I can't really comment on what what the impact would be if a mine is classified um, uh, is actively classified as having reactive ground. Um, that is something interesting, yeah, definitely something that we can look into. Thank you. Obviously, also the annual testing or the testing for reactive ground will become more important and also more um, like uh, do it do it more um, if it's an actively classified region for reactive ground. Okay, that makes sense. Anybody else have a question? Kano, please go ahead. Hi. 
Um, this is Ali. <laughs> I'm not sure if you ref you said me, but I I don't know where the entrance function is in this program. No problem. Just go ahead and ask. I was just wondering um, how large your pits are, and then how long is the strip? Because you said you drilled one borehole, but then you also said you realized it's quite variable and that the reactive ground could be um, isolated or um, occur suddenly because of the changes in the conditions. Um, because just from the coal seam, I'm from an underground mine, not open coast, um, mm -hmm. we've seen that the sulfur content can vary quite significantly, um, very fast. So you might have a borehole with a nugget effect, for example, and then um, and if they then expect you only to draw one borehole, um, over a significant distance, you you are going to miss it, aren't you? I, there's more okay. questions. Yeah, sorry, um, I'll let if I didn't um, bring the message across correctly. Okay, so in the initial investigation, we did four balls per pit. Um, we did one, which we named the control hole, and we sent it for the analysis, the sulfur concentration. And then based on that one's um, results, we then would... Um, sampled for the other three holes in the pit, um, the specific zones with the high sulfur concentration. Um, with the annual monitoring, we do um, two balls per pit. So our strip length, um, it's between two to three kilometers, um, but we also have our exploration ball information um, that can provide us with sulfur concentration um, across the, the mine. So we do also cross-check that with our reactive ground um, results. Do I answer your question, Alet? You're totally right. Um, the, the condition does change. And um, yeah, so we just hope that it's enough, that we do enough for that. Yeah, no, that, it does answer it. it okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, do you, is there any other questions from anybody? Conan, if you'll just start asking your question, please. Go ahead, your mic is unmuted, you can ask. If it's not working, you might just want to type your question in the chat box. Down in the, in the middle, there's a, an icon for chat. Just click on that and you can just type your question if, if you're not able to come through on the microphone. Does anybody else have a question? Going once, going twice, sold. Ah, there we go. There's Conan's question come up just in time. Um, Bianca, how much of your study is linked to spontaneous combustion? Okay, so um, temperature plays a major role um, in the initiation of the reaction between the sulfides and the ammonium nitrates. So spontaneous combustion does play a big role in it as it will heat up the ground conditions, heat up the ball conditions in which the explosives are pumped into. So um, not spontaneous combustions by itself, but the heat it introduces to the system definitely. Okay, so, um, and more specifically, hot hole blasting. Um, so specifically for, for hot hole blasting in, um, in an active um, reactive ground area, that is definitely a concern. Um, there are papers on um, the, the procedures that must be followed when you blast in a reactive ground area. Um, for instance, you change the type of explosives that you also use. Um, we do have hot hole blasting um, at our mine as well because of spontaneous combustion. Um, what you then do, one of the, the things that you do, um, the controls that you do is that you ensure that the sleeping time for the explosives 
is it's basically pump explosives and blasts. There's no sleeping times, no time for the reaction to take place. So um, at our hot oil, hot oil pit that, that is prone to spontaneous combustion, we pump and blast the same day. So yeah, do I answer your question? Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks guys. Anybody else? Last chance. Okay, Bianca, thank you ever so much for your presentation. Um, I certainly learned a, a, a bit about the other carbon. <laughs> it's and a pleasure. Thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you guys today. You're very welcome. We'll call you back again sometime. Okay. Everybody else, thank you for coming. And we hope to see you again at our next lunchtime lectures, <clears throat> which continue next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Greg, you can end the meeting, please. Okay, I will end it now. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.